I thought about, you know, I came up with this topic. I knew there's something about that that is true and real, but then I started thinking about examples. So mine is much less flowing and uh, beautiful than Father Michael's, but I think the examples speak for themselves. So I think the way Dick looked, for example, at Tlingit oral tradition was also inspired by the way he looked at, it's okay, I think, uh, inspired by the way he looked at um, life of Jesus and especially the orthodox vision of that life and orthodox Christianity. So I want to um, go now to Glacier Bay and the story of Shawat Sikh, the daughter of woman the true Canadian woman, uh, who volunteered to put, uh, come forward to volunteer to stay behind, sacrifice her own life to atone for the sin of her granddaughter, who had violated an important taboo and brought disaster upon her clan. This is a true Canadian story, and I hope if there are true Canadians in the room, they, they don't mind me telling it, because it's already told in, although in poetic form, in Dick's version in the Glacier Bay Concerto, um, how many people are familiar with this story? Uh, good, so I don't have to spend too much time on it. But basically, uh, the girl was uh, confined because it was her first time uh, coming, becoming a woman, and the body of the girl is changing. She's not supposed to look at her relatives or the sky, but she was so bored, so she started take, talking to the glaciers you know, as if it's a dog. And the glacier listened and started advancing. And of course, that's the story of Glacier Bay. Advancing and advancing and advancing, and then it covers the village. And that's why the clan uh, that Dick was adopted into, actually, Nora's dad's clan, um, claims Glacier Bay. Now, Dick and Nora recorded two versions of the Glacier Bay story. One told by Amy Marvin and another one by Susie James. And the story appeared in the 1987 book of theirs, Ha Shu Khan. There are different versions. So Susie James' version is somewhat more philosophical, I think, according to Dick, actually. Here's a quote. And the old woman, according to Susie James, she repeats this passage where she says, you know, they were going to leave the girl behind to pay for her mistake. And the rest of the people are leaving because they don't want to die covered by glacier. But the old lady says, quote, Take my little granddaughter aboard with you. She's a young woman. Children will be born from her. But I will not leave to go to the boats. Whatever happens to my grandparents' house, to my mother's maternal uncle's house, will happen to me. So here's the grandma sacrificing her life for the sake of the clan. Because even though her daughter is guilty, she can bear children. So she will live to carry on the line, the, mater the maternal line of the clan. And the Glacier Bay Concerto is Dick's poetic rethinking of that story, although he wove other themes, including politics, in American appropriation of Glacier Bay. But what I see in that story, just a little passage which is very Christian. So I quote, Shawat Sikh, who entered once for all, for all the people of the clan of grass, Chukanedi, and all their seed, the children of the clan of grass, by her own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Shawat Sikh, who understood without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. It rings a bell, doesn't it? The future built on dying generations, like every act of love, like every sentence of human speech, the salmon runs, and Shawat Sikh, the daughter of man, the daughter of woman, and the child of man. I think it's absolutely magnificent poetry. 
Now, later he wrote um, a separate poem in the same book, Glacier Bay Concerto, called Cas Gay. And that's the name of the woman who sacrificed herself. And there, it's a similar uh, set of words and images, but there's a slight change. First of all, in the passage I just read to you, the child of man is spelled lowercase. But in the casque, there's an uppercase. In this, I think the Christian theme is much more explicit. It's, you'd be really hard to miss. Quote, a child of life, a child of light, playing on a summer beach, securely in the synthesis of Shawat, Sikh, and Jesus, the daughter of woman and the son of man. I don't think it needs any commentary. And I, I must add that sometimes some authors, whether they're Native American or not, they try to blend Christianity and Native American spirituality, and it just does not ring true. I've come across those, and you probably have, Father. But in Dick's case, it just comes together so naturally. This idea that you sacrifice your life for others the way Christ did, and that you pay with your life for the sins of, of, of your family or clan members. That's a Tlingit idea and, and maybe Christian idea. So that's, that's one theme. Now a very different theme. Dick saw very clearly, it's in his writing, especially in the book on oratory that he and Nora put together, that in the Tlingit tradition, the living and the dead are always very close. The living remember the dead, they feed the dead, they burn clothing for the dead, they burn food with the gunk, the sihi fire dishes. The dead, on the other hand, have the names that are passed down to the living. Without your ancestors, you are nobody. You're the child of, of an empty beach, each cacao. So the living and the dead are intertwined, uh, and that's where symbolic immortality comes from. As um, I put it in my work, but I, again, it's a Tlingit idea, it's not my idea, that individuals die, humans are mortal, but their names, their crests, their houses, their regalia, their atu are immortal. Uh, as one uh, elder put, Put it, we carry our names like we carry our regalia. We put on our names. It's a beautiful image. So, just as in the Tlingit culture, you have to remember your ancestors. It's a must, it's an obligation and an honor. So, you, you have to invoke their names in the Ku'ich. But the same is true in the Orthodox tradition. It's true in other Christian denominations, but I think especially in the Orthodox tradition. Praying for the dead throughout the year, but especially during Easter. I think it's one of the reasons Easter is so important, so central to Orthodox Christianity. Um, the 40 days, of course, uh, such an intense and important period after a person's death. Uh, that's why 40 days became accepted and embraced by the Tlingit people, and that's where you get the 40-day party, which is a Russian Orthodox tradition, but becomes so Im much embraced by the Tlingit that a lot of people, I think the younger generation, don't even realize that it is an import. It came from the Russians. It is a Tlingit custom, and practiced by many Tlingit families that are not Orthodox. Now, all these things, I think Dick understood, he wrote about it. I also discovered that, but not as a folklorist, but as a cultural anthropologist through my interviews with Tlingit people, especially elders, and also what we call participant observation, and, uh, attending Tlingit funerals and being invited to Tlingit funerals, 40-day parties, and the Ku'iks. And Dick and I would compare notes. And uh, 
he supported my argument, sometimes even relied on some of my writing, but he certainly inspired me, so, and Nora did too. So this dialogue with Dick about Tlingit religion, uh, the way Tlingit remembered the, the dead and the ancestors, um, ideas about the 40-day party, uh, we were exactly on the same page. So, and I think here again, he saw parallels between Orthodox Christianity and Tlingit culture, Tlingit spirituality, um, more clearly than any other scholar. He also supported my interest in the study of Tlingit Christianity, or Tlingit view and practice of Christianity, which had not been something that previous generations of anthropologists had been interested in. We all respected and learned a lot from Frederica de Laguna, but if you read her books, there may be a few lines about Christianity among the Tlingits. Her tradition of early anthropology only studied what is, was considered traditional, pre-contact, not contemporary. And um, I felt that that was artificial. You sort of pretended that um, the Tlingit were still only practicing co and did not believe in, in Jesus and that there were no Christian traditions and so forth. And so uh, both of my works, Symbolic Immortality, which is about the traditional co but Memory Eternal, uh, which I called uh, Memory Eternal, Tlingit Culture and Russian Orthodox Christianity through two centuries. Starts in, with the arrival of the Russian missionaries and ends in the late 19, uh, 20th century. Both of those books put together, I thought, covered Tlingit spirituality to the best of my ability. They do not duplicate Dick and Nora's work. Single and omnipotent God, spirit, or deity, but by a set of rules for proper thinking, speaking, and behaving vis-a-vis -vis its non-human inhabitants, from the especially powerful spirits to the smallest creatures. This concept of moral order and respect certainly survived for the conservative elders following their conversion to Christianity. So like the right way of doing things versus the gods and what's forbidden. The basic concepts, these basic concepts are congruent with Russian Orthodoxy, whose prayer to the Holy Spirit begins, quote, O heavenly king, the comforter, the spirit of truth, who are everywhere present and fillest all things. The concept of the presence of God in all creation is also acceptable to many Protestant denominations. So he's trying to be inclusive. As an ecological aesthetic, it is also acceptable to many secular Americans. So he's trying to also show that even if you're not explicitly Christian in your views, if you believe in the sacredness of nature and, and you, you want to save the earth, basically, as many Alaskans, I think, do, you can share that spirituality. And I think that's also Dick, because some Christians in Alaska, as you all know, are very intolerant. <laughs> but Dick was very tolerant and very inclusive. So I want to end uh, by reading one more poem from Benchmarks. Um, which I think illustrates, again, this notion of um, sacredness that he saw everywhere. Um, and it's called, he saw everywhere, and that Tlingit people who maintain that more traditional view, slash Christian view, orthodox view, see. It's called Skating with My Granddaughter Jenny, on the Feast of St. Michael the Archangel, Anchorage, 1981. And that's, by the way, another proof that Dick was very committed to orthodoxy because he thought about the year, the annual cycle, in terms of feast days. I think most of us don't do that. But he would, uh, he would look at the calendar and say, oh, today is such and such saint's day. And I think that meant that his mind was attuned to the orthodox cycle. So here's the poem. It's short, but I think it's very beautiful. In falling snow, we practice figures on a skating ring. In floodlights, work for grace before an audience of night with every snowflake, a shining 
cherubic face or angel wing punctuating darkness. The ring becomes a discus and every settled snowflake a piece of some communion bread, each morsel bearing names of every person living and who ever lived. And I just really love this transition, which is kind of sudden from a very mundane, pleasurable but mundane activity of skating with your granddaughter, which he enjoyed. He loved earthy, mundane activities like growing potatoes or skating or skiing. But all of a sudden, the skating ring becomes a piece of communion. And then he's thinking about communion, of course, links the living and the dead. So it, it really, I think, illustrates the deep spirituality of the man, um, which really kind of brought together his, his own spirituality and the two traditions, the um, native Alaskan and specifically Tlingit and Russian Orthodox. So as Father was talking about um, the fact that nothing really happens randomly by chance, I started thinking that there must have been a reason that he came t up to Alaska, but especially that he met Nora, uh, because if the two of them hadn't met and fallen in love and married, and it would not have become a team, we might not have had those beautiful books, and uh, we would have been so poor, and the Tlingit scholarship would not have been so rich as we are today. So we're really blessed by Dick and Nora, and um, so we're just very, should be very thankful. Um, and remember the man and enjoy Nora's company and wish her many, many years. She's taking a little nap, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I want us to, uh, to end on a more hopeful note, and I want to read a poem, a Russian poem, and then I'll translate it. Um, it's by a very famous Russian poet, Fyodor Tuchev, a mid 19th century poem um, that I'm sure Dick, Dick knew the poet and possibly knew the poem. And um, it so happened that a few weeks ago, my mother-in-law passed away. She was 90 years old, so we knew she, her days were numbered. It was sad, but also we felt she lived, lived a very long and happy life. So at her funeral, we read this poem. And I know, except for Roxanne and Father, probably, I don't know if anybody else knows Russian, but I'm going to read it in Russian, and it's very short. Um, о милых спутниках, которые наш путь присутствием своим животворили, не говори с тоской, их нет, а с благодарностью были. Of the lovely companions who made our life worth living, do not say sadly they're gone, but say gratefully they lived among us. So our first speaker is going to be Sergei Khan, and I think most of us know Sergei quite well, at least on the organizing committee. He's been with us since the very beginning in 1993 with the Sharing Our Knowledge Conference uh, in Haines, and uh, Haines and Klaquan, where I first met Sergei. Um, he's recently published two books. Um, or, or republished one, Symbolic Immortality, and then his, one of his latest books is uh, about the 2007 Sharing Our Knowledge Conference in Sitka. Uh, Sergey, perhaps you can give some more about your background, but I'd like to get you up here. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Since you only gave me 12 minutes, um, it's very hard to say something, but um, I guess uh, I'll preface by saying that I've been involved in research, working with Tlingit people, researching culture and history, Tlingit Kusi, since 1979, that's 36 years. And it all started in Sitka, as Jerry mentioned yesterday, uh, meeting his brother Andy, 
and then meeting other wonderful people, including Mark Jacobs, Jr., and then meeting Richard as well and Nora. So I'll start with sharing our knowledge. Um, of course, this is all a commercial uh, plot to get you to buy the books by um, Hearthside Books. Um, sharing our knowledge is an unusual book because it brought together academic writers like myself and a number of other people. Tom Thornton is in it, Steve Langdon is in it, um, and others who are not at this conference but are well known to many of you as uh, scholars who've been here. Archaeologists like Madonna Moss, linguists, um, art historians, but also it has a number of, uh, of course it has Dick and Nora, a wonderful uh, paper which was their keynote address called Revival and Survival, Two Lifetimes in Flingate. And this was actually their oral presentation which I had to transcribe. So it has a flavor of an oral presentation. There's some very funny comments by Dick, including his comment on his favorite whiskey. And of course his usual comment on how he hit on his student um, undergraduate, which he wouldn't be able to get away with today. I'm sure Chancellor would agree with that. Um, but on a serious note, it has a lot of papers by uh, Flinket scholars, uh, rising scholars like uh, Ishmael. Um, but here it's not an academic paper by Ishmael, for example. He's introducing poetry by his dad. Andrew Hope the Third, um, and then we have poetry by Andy. Uh, there's a memoir by Mark Jacobs. Since the book was dedicated to Mark Jacobs, Andy Hope, um, and at the very last minute, I didn't plan it, but while the book was in production, I found out that Richard was gone, and I called the Nebraska Press. And I said, we have to include Richard as well. So there are three men, three wonderful scholars and human beings that it's dedicated to. And of course, <clears throat> we have their work. So Mark Jacobs <clears throat> was a scholar of sorts, but uh, he didn't write. He, he spoke about his knowledge. And what I wanted to include was uh, a piece he wrote for the Sitka Historical Society a memoir about his service during World War II in the Pacific. So what I'm getting at, this is not your usual academic book where everybody contributes an academic paper. It's a kind of a mix. The French call it bricolage. And I approached a couple of uh, presses and they said, no, that's not what we publish. So they turned me down. And then I went to um, Nebraska, and I published with them before. They're really good press. If you don't know, they are currently number one press for books on Native Americans, Native Alaskans, um, especially Native Americans. And they said, oh, that's kind of stuff we're interested in because we're interested in books on collaboration, collaborative research between Native scholars and Native people, elders, and academics. And I said, that's what this book is about. It's on working together um, and working, uh, listening to each other, talking to each other. That's what uh, 2007 plan conference was about and all the subsequent conferences. So I convinced them that it's absolutely okay to have papers that are of different genres. There's also a nice short paper by Harold Jacobs about his father, a kind of biography. I wrote a paper that's not entirely academic because it's my thoughts about Mark Jacobs and the history of our relationship. And I showed how the personal relations I had with him over many years, how it influenced the way uh, my research was going. So I called that paper Mark Jacobs Jr., Gustahin, my teacher, my friend, my older brother. Um, and press agreed, uh, they did a marvelous job. Um, we have all kinds of participants. We had a Russian contributor who uh, wrote about Tlingit trade with other Native Alaskan tribal nations. 
Um, we had two papers about Shotridge by scholars from the University of Pennsylvania, museum curators. Um, as a very nice paper. There were a couple of participants who spoke at the conference about Haidus and Simpson. So even though it's predominantly Tlingit subject of this book, there's a little bit on our neighbors, our brothers. So a terrific paper by Mikhail Isis Dangeli, who's uh, a Simpson scholar, and it's about a Simpson photographer, B.A. Haldane, who had a studio in Metlakatla. It's very unusual where you have a, a native person that early. Um, you know, before World War II, he had his own photo studio. And she argues that he took pictures as a native person. He saw his people uh, through a native sort of lens. And then there, there is a wonderful paper on Haida, um, Haida architecture by a very well-known scholar from UBC, uh, art historian Robin Wright. So what I chose for the title is sharing our knowledge. Of course, that's our tribal conference theme. But the subtitle is The Tlingit and Their Coastal Neighbors. So that's all the good thing about the book. Um, it also has um, lots of photographs. So if you don't feel like reading it, um, you can look at photographs, and most of them are by Peter Mavkat. They're really good. Unfortunately, we couldn't, we couldn't do pictures in color, because that would just raise the cost of the book. So they're all black and white, but they're really great. Um, there are a few pictures that I took of Mark, and there are also pictures of me and my wife, um, and um, just kind of snuck in some personal pictures of Mark Jacobs. There's a really good picture of Jerry. He looks more handsome than in real life. Um, Ishmael. <laughs> yeah. Andy Hope. Uh, it's really great. Now, the only difficulty I had, some of the authors, especially if they're not academic, they don't have any sense of like what a deadline is. So. Just bugging them to uh, to finish the work was awful, and I hate. I'm not a tough person, as you probably guessed. So telling them, please, 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 we've got to finish this, please. Uh, that was the the difficult part of this project, but we got it done. Uh, I really I'm proud of this book. It's gotten good reviews, and um, the Nebraska Press editor said that this is a model for. Um, collaborative research. And also the introduction that I wrote is pretty substantial and what I did is I reviewed the history of research among the Tlingits. So if you're interested in where we came from as anthropologists and other scholars and where we're going and how the research changed, how the relationship between Tlingit people and uh, scholars, academic scholars changed, that's the introduction. Okay. So the second book is my own symbolic immortality, or as one of my aunts, for some reason, continues to call it symbolic immorality. <laughs> um, this is the second edition of the book that many of you know, which was published in uh, 89, so a long time ago. And um, that book is out of print, so it deals with the Kuhig in the 19th century, and I've been asked by many colleagues and some native friends that I should republish it. It was originally published by the Smithsonian, but um, they ran out of copies and basically sold out. It's out of print. So it's a second edition. It's not a reprint. And um, the differences are significant. Um, I corrected some mistakes. I added new information from Dick and Norris publications, which came out after my book of 89. And uh, also there's some other, like Harold's uh, website on the memorial uh, parties. He has a very nice introduction on the Kohik. And I have an epilogue, which I always wanted to write. It's about 30 pages long. That deals with the Kohik or Potlatch in the 20th century. And it starts in the 1900s with the 1904 Kaguantan Kuhik 
in Sitka, very famous. And it ends with uh, the last big Kohinsai attended in 2006-2007. So it also, I changed the, co the cover, and this is my very favorite painting by Bill Holm of uh, a leader, a clan leader, uh, waiting, welcoming his guests to Sitka, and it's titled uh, Inviter 1803, so it's right before the Russians show up and there's Mount Edgecombe. So uh, I love this book, I love working on it. And um, the last thing I'll say is, uh, I, it got very good reviews when it came out, um, but the most, uh, the most important thing for me was Ishmael's father, Andy Hope, really liked it, and him being a Tlingit scholar and intellectual. And he was a harsh critic of anthropology that he didn't like. Uh, the fact that he liked it and he reviewed it for Tundra Times, um, not Tundra Times, there was a native uh, insert. Andrew Jones. Yeah, that meant a lot to me. And he actually nominated for a book award from the Before Columbus Foundation that he was involved in in 1990. So that meant a lot to me. And I know a lot of Tlingit folks read it. Uh, use it in their classes, so I think there's still demand for it. Unfortunately, the, the people from Hearthside thought that it was a reprint and they didn't order enough copies, but the lady there says that um, she can take your name and you can get the book. So the last thing I will say, and I know I'm running out of time, um, this is my work, but it would not have been possible without the knowledge that was shared by Tlingit elders, they're all listed in the books. Most of them are deceased, so it's in their memory. But some are still here, and of course, Dick and Nora have been uh, instrumental and helpful, and we always exchange ideas. But many, many others, and um, when somebody asks me, like, how do you know all these things? And I say, it's the elders who shared with me, but also participating in lots and lots of ceremonies between uh, 1980 and 2007. So, um, as one elder told me, he said, a lot of people have written about our ceremonies, but your book, for the first time, he talks about how we feel about our emotions. So I think there may be some small contribution that I did manage to make, so thank you very much.